Good evening, I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. It's my privilege to be joined today by a very special person to the JFK Library and the JFK Library Foundation. Chuck Daly served President Kennedy during his Senate years and in the White House. He also has the special distinction of serving both the direct, as the director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and later as executive director of the JFK Library Foundation. With assistance from his son, Charlie, also joining us today, Chuck published his memoir, Make Peace or Die, A Life of Service, Leadership, and Nightmares. In it, we learn the story of a young Irish immigrant who came to America and would eventually lead a Marine Corps platoon in the Korean War. After his military service, he became a congressional aide for a young Senator John F. Kennedy. Chuck would live out President Kennedy's call to service throughout his life. After his time in the White House, Chuck would go on to serve as an advocate for peace in Ireland and report from the field on the AIDS crisis in Africa. Chuck's life embodies the legacy of service left by President Kennedy and has always been a close friend of the Kennedy Library. And as a little bit of trivia, he even shares the same birthday as President Kennedy. Joining Chuck is his son, Charlie Daly. Charlie is a freelance writer and fellow adventurer like his father. Charlie has been published in the Boston Globe and Rome Magazine, among others. He's also worked as a surf instructor and as a teacher in Korea. We are also so pleased to welcome award-winning journalist and social and political commentator, Mike Barnacle, who will moderate tonight's forum. Mike is a Boston native and is now a regular contributor on MSNBC's Morning Joe program and other MSNBC programs. He has written more than 4,000 newspaper columns and continues to write for the Daily Beast, Time, the Huffington Post, Politico, Esquire, and others. On behalf of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, thank you all for joining tonight's program. Uh, good evening, if it's evening where you are. I'm Mike Barnacle, and welcome to uh, the program, this Zoom meeting tonight, uh, the pandemic Zoom meeting that everybody has probably participated in one way or another. Our guests are uh, Chuck and Charlie Daly. Uh, Chuck Daly, of course, uh, he's been introduced. He's had an incredible life, a life filled with a range of emotions. I'm telling you a range of emotions. I've known him a long time, and there were elements in this book uh, that I learned about for the first time. Charlie, I want to ask you as we begin this conversation, what did you learn about your dad that you did not know, and what impact did it have on you as you learn these things? I would say I learned a lot more about him than I ever wanted to, uh, to know, or maybe more than any son should ever learn about his father. Um, I think that for all that's in this book about his contributions to his country and, and to the world and to the people around him, the thing that I connected with as his son um, was the story of sort of why he is the way he is, little things that would be hard to explain um, if I didn't know the whole story. Everything from the fact that he wakes up so early and, and, he, and he's, he's someone who is very good in a crisis and, um, maybe struggles in moments that for other people are, are calm and relaxing. And um, you have to know where he's been to know why he's a little intense sometimes. Um, you know, Charlie, listening to you explain that guy sitting to your left, uh, it strikes me that you as a, as a very young man, your life ahead of you, all sorts of interests ahead of you, did you learn one of the most important things you probably did, but you'll tell me that in terms of leadership, whether it's in business or politics, everyday government, or just life in general, that you're always better off following someone who knows what it's like to have been shot at? I think my dad is a living example of the um, surprising benefits of getting shot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let that go. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I think that he would never 
he knows that leader, a, a, a true leader is someone who, uh, who goes first and would never put you in a situation that they either haven't been in themselves or would be unwilling to put themselves in. And um, I don't think a person needs to go to war to learn that. Um, I think that, um, I think all good fathers are that way. And, um, but in the case of this book, we were both in it together. This was both of our first books. And, um, and we uh, were very much um, side by side the whole time. And the parts that were hard for him, I, I tried to be there and um, have his back. And it was the same way when, when I was trying to make sense of something that he had told me and I couldn't figure out how to turn it into prose. And um, it was through that cooperation and collaboration that this came together. And, and that, that wouldn't have been possible without his leadership. Chuck, it's an amazing life that you've led and that you're still leading. Uh, the book, the book itself sort of has its beginnings on November 22nd, 1963. And on November 23rd, 1963, when you start jotting notes down on uh, six by 10 index cards in your office in the White House. We're gonna to get to a lot of aspects of your life, but the thing that struck me was that weekend, that long, long weekend that the nation and the world experienced. Uh, can you take me back to when you first decided to start jotting down those notes the day after the assassination, sitting in your office? Well, I had those in my head. Um, they became a lot fuller when uh, um, the president was uh, um, assassinated and, and Lyndon Johnson took over the uh, White House. I um, had my own misgivings about uh, Johnson, I'm sure he knows, knows about me, but uh, the uh, idea that this guy was the commanding chief who uh, was uh, very self-centered. He must have been bothered by uh, persons who have served in the military and uh, he became just a tough guy. And being a tough guy uh, with other people's lives uh, doesn't sit very well with with uh, the results. So, you know, you, uh, had, you, you had so many interesting snippets and anecdotes sprinkled throughout this book. Uh, one of the most intriguing to me was on the afternoon of November 22nd when you had the White House operators try to reach Kenny O'Donnell, our mutual friend, Kenny O'Donnell, uh, who was at the hospital. And Kenny got on the line and you said, it's a tough world. And Kenny said, Not, none tougher. And then he asked you to do two things, to open the drawer of his desk, go to his office, open the drawer of his desk, take out his rosary beads and the FBI files. <laughs> Those FBI files, uh, Kenny was keeping, apparently they contained all sorts of uh, information that J. Edgar Hoover would try to gather, probably for blackmail purposes. Do you remember taking out those files? Did you ever look at them? I very well remember those. I, I uh, noticed there were some uh, presidents, uh, now presidents, uh, Johnson's staff, around the outside edges of the, of the uh, Oval Office. I'd never seen him in it or near it before. And uh, so I asked uh, the operator to get me, uh, Kenny O'Donnell is out at the, the hospital with, uh, I was trying to say with the president, but our men, with the body of the president. But anyway, uh, he said, uh, get the lower go on my desk and pull out uh, my rosary beads. Uh, and uh, also uh, just a, a file from over the FBI. 
And I later learned that they were not extensive files. They were just uh, files of poison that uh, uh, Hoover apparently thought it was, should be brought to the president's attention. And uh, Kennedy didn't agree with that. So uh, he just short, short stopped those files. And uh, I don't think she, I'm, I'm fairly sure, but it, uh, you wouldn't uh, have brought, even referred to them. I, I really, I'm not sure, but I think he never would have referred them to the president. So uh, I uh, start, stuck the files back in the, uh, I, stuck, I stuck the beads. I don't use those, but I, I uh, stuck the file. Uh, and they were oh. apparently, they were ones where uh, bits of gossip that uh, I guess Hoover wanted to know President Kennedy was aware that yeah that he was doing that yeah yeah so, uh, and you didn't read them that he's you know Dad had the I didn't. Hoover's Kennedy file in his desk drawer and he didn't take a peek wow I did not wow. that's discipline that's discipline well, Lieutenant Daly well. <laughs> <laughs> that and, and respect and love and disgust. I don't know yeah. exactly what it was. You know, that whole crew that you worked with, though, in the White House, uh, one of the key elements of that crew was a guy by the name of Dick Donahue, <laughs> you were very close with, who I knew very well. Uh, and I always used to kid him that in making of the president 1960, Teddy White's initial foray into covering presidential campaigns, that he referred to Dick Donahue as coruscatingly brilliant. And of course, I had to immediately go to the Webster's Dictionary to look up coruscatingly. But every time I met him in all the years after that, I would say, oh, it's the coruscatingly brilliant. You got it. <laughs> and he would always have pretty much the same reply. He said, yeah, he said, it's the only word that you can get by with living in Lowell because no one knows what coruscatingly means in Lowell. <laughs> but he was quite a guy and he's a great benefactor of the library still, the foundation. Yeah, very much so. And I think that uh, you know, when uh, Dick was uh, very ill and uh, so uh, he wanted to talk to me for the last time. So uh, I went out to the hospital and talked to him for a while and then I got back down to Lowell and uh, Nancy Dunner said, uh, he wants to see you again. And uh, so I did that. And then in for the third time, I said, Jesus Christ, Dick, you got to die. You can't keep going back and forth like a yo-yo. But uh, he knew he wasn't going to get well. And uh, it was some fun with him even then. Let me ask you about a job where they don't come seeking you. You sought them. At the age of 18, you enlisted in the United States Navy. That's right. So I want to know, after you enlisted in the United States Navy, what did you tell your parents when you went home that day? And what did they say? Well, they, they were all right. I think they prefer to have a, my father and his brothers were all killed, but not my father. In World War I, they were used to serve they don't mind being killed at age 19, but at least they were already lieutenants. And here was I cleaning toilets in the nickel dime job in the Navy. So I don't know what they wanted to say. Probably a relief for them to come up for air, but I was hunk hunking around and hitchhiking and doing these other things. So uh, I uh, joined, and I think that they were, the yeah, concept of, of uh, the uh, my family, all of whom the, uh, only three of them got killed, but they were and they were nineteen years old in Battle of the Somme and so on, and they um, but they were commissioned, and uh, I was going as, as an enlisted guy, uh, cleaning toilets in Bainbridge, Maryland. That wasn't their biggest thrill. That is a uh, stunning picture in the book of your dad and his oh brother-in-law, 19 years of age, standing next to him and the different expressions on the two men's faces. 
uh, is really, it's reality. I mean, your dad has seen war. His brother-in-law at 19 is just about to be introduced to war. He's dead a few weeks later. Uh, It seems to me that knowing you, knowing of your life, and now reading in detail about your life. Yeah, uh, in fact, he he met my uh, my mother to be, but he as uh, my dad was wounded, and then he got uh, blood money to pay, not pensions, for cash for a wound, and he bought a motor motorbike after the war and put around to the young officers that had been killed under his command in Ireland. Um, in Ireland, and said. Yeah. Uh, um, how bravely they died and what and painlessly and every every figment of the imagination you can imagine of a guy uh, first got hit in the ear and then the second a few later later got hit right in the head and uh, there were not there were, there were not but a lot of a lot of people talk about uh, you know he never felt anything he sure didn't get his head, head blown off but, Chuck on. Um, on, on 12 June 1951, you got hit. And Charlie, you're writing this with your dad. And after you describe being hit, you indicate that you wrote a letter to your father. Do you remember what you wrote to your dad, to your own dad? No. In the immediate aftermath of being wounded, I, yes, it was the when you got your silver star. It was the it was a few days before that he. Um, I hadn't been wounded. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. Go go ahead. Well, I said to him something, but I, but it, it sounded it was okay. But I think I was happy that uh, I didn't think I was going to live all that long. But. Um, uh, I had a uh, picture or two in the pad of a picture of my dad and talked about uh, that I didn't have a picture at that time, but I said we had a busy and tough day. Um, later, a combat photographer happened to be there. And it was a tough, tough day for a lot of persons. And there's a picture of uh, three prisoners and we were, our, the enemy had been demoralized and, and we had lost some persons and we were a little short fused. So uh, I couldn't babysit these guys. So I said, take your clothes off. So there's a photo in the book of three young, I suppose young and very young, um, North Korean prisoners, are, their uh, hands in the air and their dicks hanging out. But I told them to take their pants off and they wouldn't be so fierce. And uh, then uh, the letter you're referring to was at the end of that day and it was um, a firefight. Um, and for his actions that day, my dad would receive the silver star, but he wrote a letter um, when it was all over to his father describing what had happened. And the way he remembers it is that um, he at that point didn't really see himself making it home. Um, so he, he, the way he described it to me originally is I, I wanted him to know that I had died trying um, was how he described that letter. That's fair. You know, Charlie, I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, and your father is the personification of what I'm about to ask you, Charlie, that uh, people who were genuinely familiar with the ugliness and the tragedy and the noise and the clamor of war and of battle, never really talk about it. And yet he talked about it with you, his son. What impact did his life, his words, his behavior under fire and his behavior every day since, what impact did that have on you? Um. I remember pretty clearly there was a day when um, I was home for an extended um, visit to to work on this book and to collect a bunch of interviews with my dad um, that would eventually become a lot of the text. 
And um, I was driving home here. It was on Cape Cod. It was a beautiful, sunny day, uh, off season. Nobody, nobody was around. And I was going past a little memorial they have in town for a, a local kid who was killed in Vietnam. And um, I don't know why. I just, I just started weeping. And I hadn't had a very emotional reaction to this material because I was just treating it like, like work. Um, and I was just overwhelmed to think that my dad was quite a bit younger than I am now when he saw and did these things. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I was just impressed that he did as well as he has um, living, living with that and moving on and, and, and finding meaning in life after combat. Um, but as for what I took away from it, I mean, I, I think that the, the impression you get in these pages from his actions and the actions of the guys he served with is that um, these are ordinary people with ordinary fears and hopes and, uh, and um, all of that who really usually rise to the occasion in circumstances that are beyond anything you or I can can imagine. And so it makes perfect sense that somebody wouldn't want to talk about that because what is there to, you know, how, how is anyone supposed to relate to that? And, and I think that when we listen to veterans tell their stories, there, there's, there's horror that we can't relate to, but there's also the connection and the, um, the, that, you know, it's almost a cliche to use the word brotherhood, but, but that, part can be equally foreign to, um, to us civilians. And so I just tried in, in, in helping him tell this story, I just tried to listen and to um, let him know that nothing, um, you know, he could say whatever he wanted. And that if all he had for me that day was a, a couple minutes about something that he couldn't talk about, that was okay. And if, and if he, needed to get something out faster than I could write it down, that was okay too. And um, what made this project worthwhile is I could see that talking about this was ultimately helpful in some way to him. And it wasn't just at compounding his, his bad memories that it wouldn't, we wouldn't have done it otherwise. I do think that there's some hope that um, after, um, Charlie pulled my, my guts apart and I had not discussed it in the details we did. Um, some hope that the reality might be uh, helpful to others. Who, uh, and that's why in a, in a medal, the glowing report of my heroic actions, that's just behind bullshit. What I what it asked Charlie to do was, right here, here's an official citation and the, and all the hoopla of heroics and so on, and write that down, and then let's let's write the truth about it, about what it's like. And I um, um, helpless prisoners, for example, one. And both sides are still quite upset, and um, one of their guys kept on screaming he was dying, and a young rifleman said. Uh, Lieutenant, can I do him a favor? I said, yeah, you do that. And I didn't do it. I had a pistol in my help, but I didn't do it. I told him to do that. It's okay. And he went and shot the guy right in the side of his head and quieted him down forever, forever. And the idea that that's what constitutes a wonderful citation that neglected to mention that sort of thing. That's a crime that I did. If it's all right with you, I'll, I'll just read the paragraph my dad is describing. Yeah. Um, so the title of this chapter is A Medal and a Crime. And um, in it, we print his Silver Star citation, which um, you can look up online. Just Google Charles U. Daly Silver Star. 050418. Um, but, um, but then we follow it with this. Those words omit the parts of the day that I would go on reliving. 
the guilt over what I did and what I didn't do, and the feeling that the bravest thing I did, that any of us did, was just keep moving uphill into gunfire. My citation leaves out a war crime I committed, a crime for which I was only punished with haunting memories. There's no mention of the men on both sides who died or sustained awful wounds for my red, white, and blue ribbon with a star dangling from it. The citation praises me for, quote, killing many enemy, but it leaves out just how hard it is to get young men to fire accurately or at all so that they kill other young men. It's unnatural to stand up, quote, in the middle of all that flying metal as Navy Cross recipient Carl Marlantis relates in what it's like to go to war. But it's also unnatural to hurl metal at a boy who's scared like you are, or to stick him with a metal blade until he dies, or lob grenades designed to be roughly the size of a baseball for familiarity's sake and flay him with shards of metal. The rules of war are unnatural. They tell you not to kill a man who has surrendered even when he's gravely wounded and probably going to die anyway, and his pitiful screams tell you that killing him would be an act of mercy. The Department of the Navy makes no mention of my after-action duties, which included going through the pockets of enemy dead, looking for intelligence, and in one case, finding a picture of a man's wife and his baby. So, Chuck, uh, 050418, you're 24 years of age. On that uh, day, that was his birthday. Yeah. Wars, in one way or another, end. But for the people who fight them, they never end. So from the age of 24 to today, you're about 107 or 108 years old, I think. Uh, you know, you've lived, <laughs> you've lived with that. And it could be a cloud formation. It could be a noise in the dark. It could be a simple memory drifting across your brain uh, that recreates something even for a second. And on top of all of that, we have lived as a nation and you have lived as an individual who cares about public service. We have lived with young people fighting a war that's lasted 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. What, is, what does that do to you on a daily basis when you see that still going on? And there are, there are kids now uh, on fire bases in Afghanistan, Marine Corps fire bases in Afghanistan, who weren't even born on September 11th when this started. What does that do to you in terms of someone who has been so involved in public service, working in the White House, and all of that. What does it do to you? It uh, doesn't go away, I suppose. One thing, I, reminders are many and very, they're lodged in my head. And thanks to Charlie, I've actually put things on paper and try, try and remember. But I also have little memories, for example, because of um, I've got this uh, wounded, um, I've got a disability rate and all that. I'm permanently uh, out of various things. I can't do with my arm. But, uh, but anyway, the um, something I'm traveling is there's a base at, called Quantico outside of Washington, about the size of the District of Columbia. It also has um, some visiting officers, some visiting Marines, not just officers, who have been retired and, and want to stay uh, part of a trip or whatever. And uh, so I use that on the en route to various places. And at once um, you can get very nice, you can get a little kitchenette and, and almost two bedrooms and it's, I think it costs like $70 a night or thereabouts. And uh, so I, I just checked in. I said, uh, Lieutenant, they still call you. Um, we couldn't save you the best room. We got a room, but uh, we've asked. We've been asked to vacate all but the 
the simplest rooms because uh, there are there are a bunch of uh, new ones. <laughs> Yeah, next of kin. New widows are coming in to uh, some gold star thing, and we'd like to be able to accommodate yeah, The other thing about you and your life, and it uh, you can transfer it to today in terms of its meaning, is that you were a product of government uh, in the sense that, you know, you were a young lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. You got that. You got that silver bar on your shoulder by the, given you by the United States government, uh, and you, you, you get out of Korea safely. Your life is saved by doctors working for the government. You go to various government hospitals. You end up at Walter Reed. Uh, all of this provided by the government, and then you go to school. You, you get a free education at Yale University on the GI Bill. Government, a government program. What are your thoughts today as you see so many public people demeaning government, trying to shrink government, saying that government ought to get out of the way? If government had ever gotten out of the way when you were 24 years of age, you wouldn't be sitting there grumpy as always the way you are today. You're right. I think that uh, oh, that's a good question. I started in a very strong way because uh, I was uh, I was a, I was a, I was an immigrant, Irish born, uh, one of those people that now uh, Trump warns us about builds a wall against. And, yeah. And then I got because of the GI Bill, an education paid for. I got uh, the uh, education uh, in part paid by, uh, in large part, paid by the government, and in one way or another paid by the government. And you're absolutely right. And, and I just, uh, I think it's, some some people say to me, uh, they see you, be kind of knocked around and see your license plate and so on. So uh, they said, thank you for your service. I really, I say, thank you for my citizenship. And I really meant it. I mean it today. So oh, I have a little trouble when people tell me how frightful the government is. And I think of persons who wounded in the North Korean or Chinese military. And they were, it's not their fault. They weren't able, they don't have the resources to take care of, of the citizenry, not just the wartime war and stuff, but just, it's just, it's a blessed system we have. And I, I, I want to I fast forward a little in terms of your life. Uh, there's so much in it, and there's so much in this book that you and Charlie have assembled and written. Uh, I mean, it's a poem to America. It's a poem to patriotism. Uh, and it's a whole lot more than that, too. But I want to fast forward. We're going to leave Korea. We're going to leave Chicago. We're going to leave the White House. I mean, amazing that you're in the White House 10 years after you're in the Walter Reed, uh, right up the street from the White House. And I'm going to ask you a question. You remember, of course, uh, Colonel Hopkins. I do indeed. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, you arrive in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I remember your little office. You were a vice president of Harvard University. My God, that's incredible. A vice president of Harvard University. <laughs> and, you were, and you were making my life difficult. Uh, yes, I was. Very, yeah. very honest. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, right. well, thank you. <laughs> but let, let baseball, me ask baseball you. Baseball and other things are too, you know. Who, we'll, we'll get to baseball and the St. Louis Cardinals and the two of you good, guys in a couple good. of minutes. But uh, what, was more, what was more difficult to deal with, Colonel Hopkins or the Harvard faculty? <laughs> well, <laughs> once when uh, Derek Bach, and God love him, he's a remarkable fellow. And, and an extraordinary uh, president of Harvard University. And, and uh, he would uh, say, uh, you know, this is the same place you also, you also worked at the University of Chicago. Those are, in very large extent, faculty run. So uh, you better uh, 
make them uh, the best possible you can find and then respect them and back them up. And if some of them are pains beyond uh, normal adventures of an ass, uh, most of them are very good. And the idea of, of uh, enabling to able to come, whether it's a GI Bill or or women, for example, an extraordinary move when they got around to letting women into uh, Harvard and rest. And I think that what comes out of all that is is overall very good. And I do think that overall, the uh, members of the House of Representatives and Senate are decent. And uh, there's some frightful persons elected by us, but overall it's a pretty good system. I guess, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, it is. Uh, the, the other aspect of, of being at Harvard uh, is the, the reach of the university itself. I mean, you've been in Korea, you've been in Japan, you've been all over the world. It's amazing that this one institution you can drop down maybe every place other than Mongolia and someone will have heard of Harvard University and its impact, its reach. What, what do you think you did, if anything, to improve Harvard while you were there? Because I know a couple of things that you did. Put up with me. Uh, yeah. In a sense, uh, rumors of Harvard owning all of the town and so on. I said, what about, uh, uh, why, don't, why don't we um, list every single piece of property we own? At the particular time I went there and been there for a few months. And uh, well, what, what about, what does that entail? Well, one thing it entails is uh, that Harvard owns cold water flats. And uh, the second thing I know is that you, uh, Mr. President of the University, uh, your name is on those because that's by law. So first, why don't we start off with every single piece of property we own in uh, Harvard and Boston and say, as of this date, I didn't push it all away, but try to, but no, no, if we print everything we're gonna do, we have, and we also say for the period of say seven years, I think it was seven years, we make clear any piece of property that, that we're gonna buy and um, print it, the whole thing in the Harvard Gazette. And the general, he's a very decent fellow, he doesn't swear either, other than that he's a very good guy, but he uh, said, you're gonna print that in the Gazette? And I say that for perpetuity, but let's just start it with that and uh, try to Harvard and Alston, I mean, Boston or Alston, whatever it is, just try yeah. to say, okay, this is what we're doing. And we're screwing yeah. things up. We're trying to build a power plant where we shouldn't, and we didn't. Um, but maybe what about the What about the other building uh, that they wanted to build, but couldn't, not shouldn't, but they couldn't, the JFK Library in Cambridge. Uh, right. The library today is an it's a it's an incredible facility and it's a exactly beautiful right. facility. Yeah. But the idea, the original idea, the president had when he visited Harvard, I think shortly before uh, his death, was to have the JFK Library along the banks of the Charles in Cambridge. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, or do you have any thoughts on it now? Yeah, I did have a thought. Then I thought. Uh... <laughs> You, you're the one who described all the horrors of being inflicted by uh, little Catholic children running around. And, yes, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, I happen to be in, in favor of the, uh, the library being located in Cambridge and a certain amount of heat from some of the Somerville and so on. Um, and eventually, after all the other presidential libraries had been built and in place and we're still screwing around trying to get this done. And uh, then a guy, Bob Woods, who ran the 
Massachusetts, UMass on, on the, the water, not in Cambridge, but uh, that was done. I think that partly um, Jacqueline Kennedy was fed up with all this. So anyway, we built the library. The built was built, I should say, the library by the people in um, uh, at, at University of Mass campus, away a good distance away. Um, and I think I said uh, when I asked about that, I said it's a nice site, and I, I paraphrase it. I don't know exactly, and with a lot of hard work and good luck, it might be it might amount to something. That's a tough shot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a tough shot by various other reasons. And not for the first time, I had some, you wouldn't you soften the words? I said, you soften the fucking deed, I'll, I'll soften the words. So uh, it turned out it's a great location. Even better is uh, UMass Boston, a public institution uh, with the side it is. But attraction it is. is that uh, it changed the, neighbor, the neighborhood there drastically. Um, there were a few dead bodies around because of, so one of the uh, Irish mafia got exposed of something we didn't know about, but that's uh, nothing to do with us. Well, they dug the hole, but that was before we got there. Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. So, um, so since this is the JFK Library podcast, I will read the um, history oh, of the library right, as it's right. presented in the book. By the end of 64, I and Pei had been chosen to design the building that would house the archives and museum. The next step was to find a location Jackie wanted Cambridge and Harvard. However, this proposal drew protests in a classic not in my backyard situation. There were fears of traffic in an already congested part of town and the prediction of over 1 million new visitors to the neighborhood annually was seen as a burden rather than a blessing. The fight was still raging when I got to Harvard. By then LBJ had already seen his own presidential library completed and dedicated in Austin, Texas. I was in favor of the Harvard location. It would have been good for both the library and Harvard, but by 1975, the plan was scrapped. Meanwhile, the University of Massachusetts Boston campus under the leadership of Bob Wood, a former member of the Kennedy administration had been pitching their own proposal to Jackie, hustling for the university's land to be used to build the library. A committee went with that idea and decided to build it out at Columbia Point among some ugly university buildings around the corner from a rough housing project and a beach where gangland murder victims were buried on a windswept appendix of land that had once been an actual dump. They envisioned potential in the site focusing on the sea and the city skyline. In 1977, they broke ground out at Columbia Point. 11 years later, I was running the place. <laughs> And you're in it well, Chuck. You're in it well. Yeah, listen, on that on the book, you can tell that uh, Charlie yeah. kept me as precisely as possible. Listen, be, be, before we wrap this up, uh, I'd like to I'd like to start with you, Charlie. Uh, if you could talk about what you learned about life and your life from your father. Oh man, I, I don't know where to start with that, except that um, I think that anyone who has an older um, father, can, yeah, I hate to put it that way, but it is what it is. Jesus. Can, um, no, I'm, I'm 93, he's learning. I, um, you can relate to, there's a certain attitude of just nothing's ever really a big deal. Um, and I saw a lot of my friends where I was talking to a friend of mine about the book the other day and his, his grandfather had been like a frogman in World War II, frogman in World War II. And um, his dad does something. I don't, I don't know. He doesn't know. And he, he loves his grandfather and he kind of doesn't have time for his dad. And um, I've, I've noticed that that's, that's a thing. And I've, I think I'm really lucky to have to have a father who was born in the twenties and a mother who was born in the fifties. Um, it's just, it's, it's a different attitude. It's a different culture. Um, and, 
but that was true before before we worked on the book. Um, I I don't know. I I think that um, this book really put me in touch with uh, what we owe the people who came before us in general, not just people who yeah. served, not just people who died, but but um, but the people who who gave us the things we didn't have to work for in a free society, um, who gave us voting for everyone. And, and, um, and I think the thing that I learned more than anything doing this project is that everyone should do a version of this with someone in their life. It doesn't even have to be your, your family. And it doesn't even have to be someone who, who rubbed elbows with world leaders or, or um, was involved in epic battles. It, it could just be somebody who who lives through some interesting times that you'd like to know more about. Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be a book, you know, you just they have apps now where you can record someone's voice, sit down and, and talk to your, your grandparents while you still can. Um, that's what or I do like. something or do something really unusual in this day and age, Charlie, sit down and establish eye contact with another yes. human being instead of your phone. Yes. You know? <laughs> something like that. But yeah. y- y- you know, your dad is your dad's a little older than I am, and I'm a lot older than you are. Uh, and my wife and I, we have seven kids. And after what you just said, uh, I would just urge you, and I know I don't have to urge you, I know you'll do it. Hold on to your father's world mm. because it is a great world. And Chuck, as we leave, I want to ask you basically the same question I asked Charlie Daly sitting next to you. What did your father teach you and how many times a week do you think of your own dad? I, I, the last part is uh, regularly I think of him. I admire him greatly. He was, he was badly wounded in World War I. He uh, um, was was a, got a job in India, became a big horse in, in uh, Shell Oil and so on. And uh, then uh, one day he uh, um, there was something the matter with him. And he's a good golfer and all those things. Uh, so he um, asked me to want to go to uh, a, a drive with me. He got it, just the two of us. Was terrific. And I went from uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. And I didn't know what we were going for. And so um, Dad had a meeting with the doctor, and I happened to have the, uh, to overhear it, Snoopy. But uh, he said, uh, well, we think that you have uh, multiple sclerosis. I don't know what they meant. But uh, he said, uh, you uh, have, you'll have some serious um, health problems that won't go away. And uh, that uh, what you do, the best you can do is said, uh, uh, no more drinking or, or smoking or, or a whole, whole litany of those things you cannot do anymore. And uh, doctor, would you like me to go and home and live in a vacuum tube and uh, said good day and he said uh, came out to me and he said let's go on home and, and I know five o'clock's kind of a sacred hour they have gin um, we got the car and, and uh, went home and uh, he uh, was horrified when he couldn't participate in the uh, World War II <laughs> but he he uh, uh, he became a, uh, a buyer of trading destroyers for uh, the world, for FDR to get the support from from England in the way of destroyers and so on. And was very active. Um, and she showed me, I think that, uh, I don't know, I, don't know it was, I think it was Churchill, I mean, Churchill, silly, um, Kipling, who incidentally lost the war, lost the son in World War One, but he had, I think he was he said, if you can uh, 
read uh, with, with uh, triumph and if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters but you're same, then you're a man. Chuck Daly, my old friend, Charlie Daly, my young friend. Uh, I want to thank both of you for doing this. Uh, you're both invaluable resources. Chuck, your life has been extraordinary, and I thank you for sharing it with us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. This is terrific. <laughs>